Wait, what was the full scope of the Voices of Terezin project last spring at mm. AU? Mm -hmm. In addition to the course and multiple panels with professors from um, diverse disciplines, we had a full library exhibit, which a graduate student in arts administration developed and presented. We had multiple film viewings around Terezin, including 22 minutes that have survived of the propaganda film that was done um, around Terezin. We had poetry readings, we hosted several people from Prague, um, talkbacks for each of the productions in the way that you're doing, and um, really it became a university-wide project. Our new dean decided that this was something that he was very interested in putting center stage literally on campus uh, because dialogue was facilitated on so many levels. And, and, and as I said, it really had its own life. We have a website, too. You can go to the website. The uh, Chair of Jewish Studies took this on. The Holocaust Museum got involved. We had guest lectures. Um, I started out to do a one-act play, Smoke of Home, and it became something else. Now, Rain is using in her production something else that evolved out of the work um, that I did in Prague. There's a bookend to the production that you will see, a prologue and an epilogue. Um, a colleague of mine who is a playwright, she's Dean of Art and Architecture at Penn State, came to Prague and spent, oh, I guess she was with me for three weeks working on the, the prologue and epilogue to provide context for American audiences. Because I found that a majority of American audiences do not know the story of Terezin. And that's another, I think, significant charge that I feel with the project. Now, in the prologue and epilogue, there's uh, poetry. Um, there, there are also, I know in your honors class, you, you use the technique of having your students speak the words of poems from mm -hmm. I have not seen a butterfly around here and things like that. What do you feel is the importance of having the actual words? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the reasons um, I wanted to include some of the poetry of Rilke in that um, prologue and epilogue is it was the poetry of Rilke that actually inspired Jerzy Stein and Zdenia Gelias to generate Smoke of Home. So some of that poetry is there, and it's so beautiful. Um, the play ends, actually, and I don't know, I haven't seen Raina's production, but the very ending is from a real case, if you're, did you keep it intact, the mm -hmm. ending? Mm -hmm. It ends with this, and I, I found this very important. Go dry your tears and smile with eyes still smarting. Every day something is starting, something beautiful is starting. So that you deal with the melancholia, but there's still a sense of something uplifting, potential for hope. And then the poetry. <laughs> poetry for children and young adults. How many of you are familiar with the poem, I Never Saw Another Butterfly? Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Um, and I've seen some, the original drawings are at the Jewish Museum in Prague, and a colleague of mine is the curator there. I've been able to see some of the original drawings. Um, it's, it's quite astonishing. The butterfly poem was written by Pavel Friedman when he was 20. I'll, I'll present that to you if you'd like to hear it aloud because I think it's significant. The last, the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow, perhaps if the sun's tears would sing against a white stone. Such a yellow is carried lightly way up high. It went away on shore because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. For seven weeks I've lived in here, penned up inside this ghetto, but I have found what I love here, the dandelions call to me and the white chestnut branches in the court. Only I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here, in the ghetto. I mean, the, the, to hear that voice. And my cast has learned it in Czech um, and will present it in Czech and in sign language um, so that it extends and communicates. The sign um, for ghetto is 
this. And it's very powerful because their costume has the, the star right here, and you see the word Yoda. So when they do this, you get a sense of what does that badge represent. But I think taking the poetry and, and using it and interlacing the Czech language enhances the, the, as much of the authentic nature as you can capture. Uh, can you articulate why you are drawn to this particular part of the Holocaust to dramatize? Is it your heritage or...? I, I think it's just a lot of synchronicity because, of course, it's my heritage. Um, I was sharing with Raina, I mean, the irony is that my mother never did go to the Czech Republic and she was so thrilled that I had this Fulbright and um, she passed away on the day I came back to the United States. I mean, it was just uh, incredible. And I said, I think she's probably smiling down on me because our heritage was so significant. But as a director, um, again, you know, I'm drawn to messages that I think um, are significant. And one of my students asked me about what are the messages, and I never saw another butterfly. And I said, I can't really fully tell you all of that. And we have to be willing to live with the ambiguity that the audience members will take with them what resonates and connects for them. And hopefully we serve the integrity of the piece and the pieces. So um, I'm drawn to the stories. And I suppose as an artist, I'm drawn to the extraordinary circumstances in which these people lived and created. One of the exercises we do with the young people is called, what would you do? If you received your transport notice, you had 24 hours to gather what mattered for you, to put it into your suitcase. You could not take more than um, 100 kilos, which would be about 50, uh, kilos. Uh, 50, 50 kilos, kilos, 102 pounds, excuse me. And that was it. What would you put in there if you had to put what mattered to you? And there are all sorts of stories, and we know of interviews with survivors of people who took, some who took books, some who took valuable objects that were then taken away from them and actually on sale in the store and they would have to buy their own things back. One um, musician took his violin, he took the instrument apart and took the instrument and the glue. Edgar Crossa tells that story. Um, we thought about what would we take? What would you take? And Raina and I were talking about if we were there, what would we have done? We're artists, we're teachers. Hopefully we would have, under the extreme circumstances, somehow gone on to create, to, to generate. The intellectuals who were there at Terezin gave lectures. Supposedly there were enough lectures that every day for the life of Terezin there would have been at least one. And you can read them in a book entitled University Over the Abyss. And as a, a professor, I'm fascinated by that. Um, there's just so many dimensions. Um, and then the, I read, Lisa Peschel introduced me to the, um, uh, the writings of a woman, Eva Kavanova, who was herself um, a young actress. She was Michelin. She was able to survive Terezin because her father, who wasn't Jewish, did not denounce her or her mother, and she had some special considerations. But she um, wrote an interesting paper about Theodore Terezin in 1967. She wrote it while she was a student at the academy, where I actually taught in Prague. And then I found out that she even became a professor there. Um, I hope someday to be able to do a one-woman show on her writings. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get permission because her works are in the Jewish Museum in Prague. But listen to this. Listen to this quote from her. The spectator sat followed, evaluated, and looked forward to further performance. As long as we were under the influence of theater, before the enchantment wore off, we carried away a consciousness that we had experienced something, we had laughed at something, had meditated with someone, simply something was expressed, and we left with an awareness that we were still alive. And then she added these two other statements. One such evening of theater helped lure us to survive another day. We did theater like medicine and doctors, 
very often using only a word. So I, I think about that, and there's just so much resonance, and I know as a director and teacher you can understand that too. Edgar Crossa was talking about Raphael Schechter, who did Verdi's Requiem in, in the ghetto, and uh, he said that he, he saw Raphael Schechter as a psychologist without a degree, because when he got there he realized that people were so mired down in this depression of what their life had become, and they were sitting in their barracks at night just brooding about what has happened. And he said, we have to sing. And he got people together, and just people flocked to him. And even though the elders said that if you, if you do this Verdi's Requiem and the camp commander finds out the reason why you're doing it, which was, in, in Raphael Schechter's mind, it was uh, a mass for the dead Nazis, um, his revenge on them, uh, that he would be shot and the whole chorus would be deported. And he said, if you do not want to do this, you don't have to, but they all stayed. And then when, when people were, were transported out, more people came at knowing the risk, but because it filled them with hope and a sense of purpose. There's um, a particular piece that Schwenk wrote um, that was performed in the camp, and it became what is called the Terezin Hymna, sort of, um, I, some referred to it as sort of the rally cry, but it's really, really interesting in its outlook because here are some of the lyrics, and I'm learning them in Czech, but I won't do that right now. We will conquer and survive all the cruelty in our land. With the laughter in our hearts, we're hand in hand. Days will come, days will go, always moving, restless, proud. We can't write with only 30 words aloud. I'll tell you about that. Wait, for we will see anew, a dawn must rise to lift the heart. The time will come to pack our bags and homeward joyfully depart. We will conquer and survive all the cruelty in our land. We will laugh on ghetto ruins hand in hand. So there's something in all of this that... I don't know, for some sustained, for some it was probably a natural outpouring, um, and then you had this conflagration of artists collected together in the combined circumstances, practicing what they knew. 30 words. Oh, 30 words. So um, at one point they were allowed to send out postcards, but they were limited to 30 words in terms of what could be sent out from the ghetto, and of course, subject to great scrutiny. So that's why the reference to um, only 30 words. Um, 